Welcome to There is a Method to the Madness. My name is Rob Maxwell. I'm an exercise physiologist and personal trainer. I'm the owner of Maxwell's Fitness Programs and have been in business since 1994. The purpose of this podcast is to get to the real deal of what really works and most importantly, why things work. Hence the name, The Method to the Madness. Today, I'm going to talk to you about your correct cardiorespiratory training zones and intensities. Before I get to that, let me thank Jonathan and Lynn Gilden of the Gilden Group at Realty Pros. They are committed to providing the highest level of customer service and they have the home sales and the great reviews to back that up. So please give them a shout at 386-451-2412. Let's talk about some training zones. Intensity is very, very important for sure when it comes to strength training, when it comes to cardio, really when it comes to any form of exercise, we have to get a good idea of what the intensity should be. Now, I will say I don't want you to get so bogged down in that to where you don't exercise because the number one variable that even trumps intensity is consistency. We definitely want to get into a good exercise routine and we don't really want anything to get in the way of that. So paralysis of analysis got in the way of that. I don't want that. But that's a big reason why I do this podcast is so I can teach you what you should be doing and hopefully simplify it because there are a lot of people that complicate things out there and they just don't need to really. All right. So let's talk about some training zones. Now, when we go out and do our cardio, a lot of people say, you know, how hard should I be following my heart rate? Should I be doing other ways of tracking this intensity? And let me first state that there really is no perfect way. But the heart rate zones, along with rate of perceived exertion or RPE, does work really well. In other words, If you understand what a zone should kind of feel like and then also have some general guidelines as far as your heart rate, that really is a win-win situation so you can really learn yourself and know where you should be. So there are some errors though, and I know a lot of people use the smart watches now like Apple watches, Garmin, Fitbits, and they have built-in target heart rates and that's great. And, And as I said, it doesn't have to be super complicated. So the zones may be perfectly fine for you. And then after listening to this podcast, maybe you can fine tune them a little bit if you need to. But one thing you have to understand is these watches, these smart watches, these Fitbits, whatever you want to call them, they use different logarithms and they use basic formulas for target heart rate. And what we know about estimated maximum heart rate is it could be off by 15 beats of a standard deviation. So that means either direction it could be off. That's pretty massive. So in other words, to get your target heart rate, it has to estimate your maximal heart rate because that's what your target heart rate comes from. Now, the the guidelines have always been essentially from the estimated maximum heart rate of 220 minus your age. There's been other ones through the years that are used, and uh, but they all come out to be about the same. But most of them still use 220 minus your age as an estimated maximal heart rate. The reason why they got that is because they figured out early on that after the age of 20, we essentially lose one maximal heartbeat per year. All right, so... 220 minus 20 is 200, and then when you get to 21, it's 199, and so on and so on. But as I said, if we're just using the maximal, that could be off by 15 beats in either direction, so that's pretty massive. So let's say your your estimated maximal heart rate is supposed to be 200, but for some reason yours is lower, which doesn't make it bad, by 15 beats, now it's 185, that's going to throw off all the percentages, or it could be 215. And by the way, your maximal heart rate is not a reflection of your fitness. The percentages we can train at at certain speeds is a good indicator of your fitness. 
but not whether or not your maximal heart rate is high or low. So don't get too concerned about that. Some people just have higher maximal heart rates than age predicted, and some people have lower. So a lot of the watches are using the age predicted, and some of them are also using the maximal heart rate they see as you exercise. That's fine, but that could be off too. Like what if you never go very hard, then the only number it has is a pretty low number. And also, you know, they're pretty good at picking up heart rate, but they're not perfect. So we do have to watch that. So there are errors built in. That's really all I'm saying about that. And that's okay. I mean, come on, man. Apple Watches and all that, they're not in the business of that. I mean, they're designed to do other things. And I think they do a pretty good job as an exercise watch for what you want to use it for. But they're not going to be perfect. But if we understand the science a little bit, we can fine tune those bad boys a little bit. Now, most of them give you like zone fives or a, <laughs> they give you five zones and they definitely give you a zone five, but they give you five zones with zone one being the easiest and zone two being the majority of what most people will tell you to do your cardio in. And there's, there's a lot of truth to that in the easy or moderate zone. We should do a lot of our cardio. Zone three is typically a little bit harder than that. Zone four is you're getting into like a tempo training, race pace, close to race pace type of thing. And then zone five would be all out. That's pretty much how they do them. But I want to give you my max fit ways of zones that I like a little bit better. You can use them along with your smart watches or you can, again, fine tune that a little bit. But let me give you some zones I like to use. So... For the first zone, I like to call it light. Very simple. I mean, the American College of Sports Medicine uses the first zone as light, but it's just light cardio training. And the estimated target number I like to use for that is 65% or less. So figure out your estimated maximal heart rate, or if you know your maximal heart rate, times that by 0.65. And that is going to be your light intensity. That would be a great zone for fat burning because we do burn more fat at the lowest intensity. We don't burn as many calories, so it is a little bit deceiving when people tell you to only train in low heart rate zones because you are training with less intensity, so it's going to be less calories, but the calories burned are going to be from a greater percentage of fat. The other benefit to training in that zone is you may not be robbing your muscle tissue as much. You might not be cutting into your muscle tissue. So to keep it simple, that zone is really good for warm up, and it's really good for long, slow distance, easy cardio, and it should feel light. It should feel very light, something you can do pretty much all day. And again, the percentage I like to use is 65%. The next zone I like to use is I just call moderate. ACSM calls it moderate. I changed the zone a little bit because I like to have a little wider gap just in case there's some inaccuracy, you have a little bit of wiggle room. And I like to use 65 to 80% of your maximal heart rate for that zone. That is still very aerobic. And that means essentially that your body is still processing oxygen aerobically. So you still are burning a lot of fat. You're burning a little bit more carbohydrate in that zone than you are in the first zone, but you're still burning a lot of fat. It is also a zone that you can pretty much go almost all day at. Like 80% sounds very high, I get it. And sometimes it sounds confusing, like it's like, well, 80%, I mean, if my car goes 100 and I'm going 80, I mean, I'm, I'm going almost as fast as it can. So yeah, it, it can seem like that, but it is still a very, very doable heart rate pace. And different types of modes are going to affect that, like 80%. Maximal heart rate on a bicycle is going to feel a lot harder than if you're jogging because on a bicycle, you're only using your legs pretty much to get the heart rate up. So you're going to feel a lot of localized muscle burn. So it's going to be kind of deceiving, but it is still the same intensity. It just might feel a little different. All right. So 65 to 80 percent somewhere in there is a nice moderate zone for you. It should feel comfortable. I mean, the first zone should feel easy. This should feel comfortable. The next zone I like to use, I don't like to use five. I think that's too many. I like to use four. The next zone I like to use is my zone three. And simply I call that vigorous. And vigorous means that 
it's harder for sure. I mean, you're definitely working. You can't really carry on a conversation as much as you could in the moderate zone, but you can still talk. But instead of being able to, like we used to do at the talk test, you know, have somebody state the Pledge of Allegiance, and if they can belt it all out, they're definitely still in a nice light to moderate zone. Well, that's not going to be overly possible in the vigorous zone, but you're still going to be able to talk. You're still not maximally taxed. So the heart rate zones I like to use for that is 80 to 90% of your maximal heart rate. Again, that sounds like it's almost all out, but it's really not. If you've ever run or anything like that, you'll find that you know, for a lot of people, you can get into that zone fairly easy. Now, it's definitely work. It's not a zone that you are going to attempt to do for your long, slow distance or over distance or really long cardio. It's going to be shorter segments of maybe 10 to 20 minutes at a more brisk, harder pace because we don't want to overtrain. But you are going to be able to sustain that for something like a 5K or again, shorter in training. It's just gonna feel, it's gonna feel vigorous. It's gonna feel pretty tough, but it's gonna feel somewhat doable. And I know that sounds kind of vague. That's why the, the best way to do all this is to really get familiar with your own body and see what works. But it's going to be a harder, but doable zone. Okay, 80 to 90%. My final zone that I use for people and myself is just what I call hard. So we got light, we got moderate, we got vigorous, and we got hard. And hard is 90% of your maximal heart rate and higher. So 90% to all out. That would be a, a zone that you would definitely like race in if you're doing 5Ks, um, triathlons, like that's gonna be what I like to call your red line pace. I mean, you're gonna be pushing. Now, if you're at like 90% or so, like you're gonna be able to do that for minutes uh, at a time and maybe even a little longer than that based on your conditioning because if you're in excellent shape, if you're in excellent cardiorespiratory shape, you can train above 90% because you're not above your anaerobic threshold. So, and there comes the thunder booms if you could hear it out there. So, it, and I, but I don't want to confuse you with that because that's really more of a concern of endurance athletes. But the point of that is that it can be sustained. Now you get around 100%, I mean, you're gonna be backing off. Um, and by the way, it's not dangerous to be there unless you have a pre-existing condition. You know, people ask about that. It's like your body will do what it needs to do before you ever get into trouble. It'll slow you down. But if you have a pre-existing condition, of course, that's not the case. But I don't want you to think if, if everything's fine, your doctor always tells you everything's fine with your heart, you do your medical checkups and everything's good, that you're going to get yourself in trouble when you go to higher intensities. That's really not the way the body works on that. All right. But it definitely feels hard. And I like to have people do their intervals if they do interval training in that zone. So if they're doing like, say, 400 meter repeats, if they're a runner, and that means they're going to do 400 meters as fast as they can then it's gonna be into that zone. So it's gonna be definitely a pushing zone. And again, that would be above 90%, all right? Now, again, I just wanna wrap this up by saying, you know, don't get overly too confused or too OCD. You know, I can be guilty of that. Overthinking things and then keeping yourself from exercising, you know? The zones are a tool to help you. You don't need, need to be a slave to zones. If we understand the science, then we're going to be just fine and we're going to use these zones as a tool. So, for example, like zones one and two, most research shows that we should do most of our cardiorespiratory exercise in those zones. We don't need to be killing ourselves when we do cardiorespiratory training. It, most, some people, it, it, it goes, it's a little debatable on the exact number, but I will say that I tend to agree with most experts will say that 80% of your training should be at the lower intensities. A lot of people, especially endurance athletes like runners and triathletes are guilty of always going hard. So they're always in those top two zones, pushing themselves and pushing themselves. I mean, in a way that, you know, you give them a pat on the back because they definitely have a good work ethic, but 
That's not being overly disciplined because we actually really improve our fitness at the lower intensities too, and we don't overtrain. So we can do more training when we're training in zones one and two because it's not as taxing on the body. So think of it that way. Try to do most of your cardiorespiratory training in those first two zones. In other words, what feels light to moderate. Do a little bit of training in either the third or the fourth zone, you know, where you're pushing yourself maybe once or twice a week where you're kind of pushing yourself aerobically. And that would be a really good cardiorespiratory diet for you. All right. So I really hope that helps. And again, we like to use the science to help you understand what you need to do. And so now I just want to wrap this up by saying thank you, Overhead Door of Daytona Beach. You know, I can't thank these guys enough and the Gildans of the Gildan Group Realty Pros. I mean, the MaxFit Games are coming up. Both of them jumped on as sponsors with Overhead Door being our gold sponsoring, sponsoring the event with $1,000. I mean, how cool is that? The Gildans gave an absolute a lot of money too. So I thank our sponsors. And I only, I only allow sponsors on the show that I really believe in. And I've had to vet and, you know, and, and make some changes, you know, and I just felt like they weren't representing what I really, really want. And But man, with these two, you know, I'd like to keep them as long as possible. Overhead Door of Daytona is the absolute best in garage sales and service. So please give them a shout at overheaddoordaytona.com. It really helps me if you will download these episodes and if you will subscribe to the show, that would uh, be greatly appreciated. So until next time, be max fit and be max well. 